Um, it's really great to be here. Uh, I've really uh, had a great time chatting with a lot of you. Um, and uh, in a way, this is coming full circle for me. I left Wisconsin uh, right after undergrad. Now I'm finally back there. Um, and just as uh, that has gone full circle, my PhD research started out spending an entire summer in a small bunkhouse mm -hmm. in a small town in Alaska with Bob Gubernick. Um, and so I'm glad to see him back and some familiar faces here. Uh, everything goes full circle in academia, of course. Um, and so uh, I wanted to first acknowledge uh, some people who helped me out with this project. Uh, it's been great to work with all these partners. Um, and I especially want to point out uh, laser. Um, the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District, who funded part of this research, and my postdoc funding came from the NOAA Group in Ann Arbor, which is uh, the Cooperative Institute for Limnology and Ecosystems Research, and then I'm housed right now at the Center for Limnology at UW-Madison. Um, as Amy kindly said in my introduction, because I wrote it, um, one exciting thing uh, is that um, Des Moines has gotten a lot of attention the last 36 hours um, and the last few months, um, and I wanted to point out that uh, I'll be moving there, and so I'm really excited to meet a lot of the Iowans I've already met. Um, but uh, if I haven't met you and you want to chat, especially after you see um, what I do, uh, I'll be here throughout today. Um, and my contact information, you can still email me uh, at plevi at wisc.edu. Um, but as Amy pointed out, I'll soon be at Drake uh, right in the middle of Des Moines. So I'm excited about that, and I really love nitrate. So it's a good place to be. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to start with a broad introduction, and when you do a Google image search for different uh, professions of the people here, uh, you get some pretty interesting pictures. Of course, the hydrologists are hard at work. Um, the ecologists can't get very far without stopping and looking at bugs. Um, geomorphologists are never really too impressed. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and the engineers, you are, uh, there's just a lot of stock photos. You have to page through a lot of pages when you just type in engineer before you find anything else, I just grabbed a stock photo. So I'm sure you're all in the field in your suits. Um, but <laughs> So I'm coming at river restoration and stream restoration from the ecology perspective. Um, and so because of that, I think that some of the tools that I used in my uh, PhD, which was not with restoration at all, um, might uh, be well suited to help us assess and monitor restorations. Um, and so when we think of this broad suite of restorations, we have them in you know, natural, pristine ecosystems uh, where we're dealing with fish passage is issues. Uh, suburbia is a great place for restorations. And of course, a lot of the talk um, so far, a lot of the talks have focused on agricultural ecosystems. Um, and, and sort of less, less mentioned so far have been the urban ones, but those could be equally as important, um, especially because small, dense areas of humans can have a major, major impact on freshwater resources. And so this is what I'll be talking about today, but of course I think the, the metrics that I use can be applied to any of these um, ecosystems, and, uh, and uh, we'll see what you think. <laughs> um, so we'll jump a little bit east here to our fair city of Milwaukee. Um, so Milwaukee has been uh, developed for quite some time. Uh, some of the rivers have been heavily channelized, and in the 1950s and 60s, they started uh, making a lot of concrete culverts um, instead of rivers uh, just to get the water off the landscape, like a lot of you uh, probably know the history of that. Um, and so in recent years, the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District has been doing a lot to undo that. And uh, one example, um, Milwaukee's known for many things, one of them being uh, the beer. Um, and so even though the beer's gone elsewhere, I believe Pabst Blue Ribbon is now brewed in St. Louis, um, the property is still there. And Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District has partnered with a couple nonprofits as well as the former owners of Pabst Brewery um, to give it a storage capacity of 500,000 gallons of rainwater underneath the old factory. Um, so this is a really innovative approach to trying to deal with stormwater in urban areas. Um, and even though they did fund me, I'm, I'm not being told to say this, um, but they're really innovative in what they're doing. A lot of this has been unprompted. They're doing a lot of these things in the Milwaukee area because they know that these are the things we need to do to um, deal with stormwater in urban areas, um, and they're kind of staying ahead of the curve of regulation. Um, but be, by doing that, they're also being very innovative um, and kind of leading the country in that regard. So um, if you haven't chatted with people from MMSD yet, I highly recommend it. Um, they're a great group to work with. Um, and right now they're working on this Fresh Coast 740 pro, uh, project in which they want to be able to capture 
the first 740 million gallons of water that falls on Milwaukee when there's just a half inch of rain. Um, and they're well on their way to do that, and that's a really impressive uh, goal, and they're, they're almost there, so um, kudos to MMSD. So where does my research come in as a stream ecologist? Um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of concrete channel in Milwaukee, as you can see on the left hand of these photographs. Um, but then they're also doing a lot of restorations, as you can see on the right hand. And so as a stream ecologist, I was really interested in, in trying to understand what's the ecological value of these restorations. Um, so Rob, this morning, summarized it really well of those different tiers in restoration. So MMSD, they're totally concerned with tier one. They're concerned about the hydrology. They don't want downstream flooding. So they know that if they tear up some concrete and put in a more natural channel, they can uh, make the floodwaters uh, damage downstream ecosystems a little bit less. They've also built some huge retention ponds, not only under Paps Brewery, but in else, uh, other parts of the city as well. And so their big goal is the hydrology. So that's the tier one. So I'm interested in tier two and three. What about the ecosystem? What about the biota? Um, and so that was my first question, is what's the ecological value of these restorations you see on the right side of these photographs? Secondly, um, I'm also interested in scale. So not quite the scale that Rob was talking about earlier today, um, but rather the scale of going from this small headwater stream, which is about a half meter across, um, and about uh, 15 liters per second. And I know that that's a dead giveaway that I'm an ecologist. That's about a half a CFS. Um, up to a larger river system, which at base flow, this one's about um, 150 uh, liters per second. So um, about seven CFS. Um, but the concrete channel here is about nine meters wide. So much different system than this one. So do we see a difference in ecological value between concrete and restoration? And secondly, do we see a difference in the ecological value gained between headwater and a more main stem river? So those are the two questions I want to address today. Um, this uh, is a map showing the major watersheds of Milwaukee. Milwaukee County here is outlined in red. Another very innovative approach of MMSD is to actually think beyond the watershed boundaries. Um, so they're uh, working with different groups outside of here. We have some representatives from Ozaki County who are here um, talking uh, that have done some projects in that county just north of Milwaukee County. Um, and you can see that what's, what's great about downtown Milwaukee, which is right about here, is there's a confluence of three major river systems that come right to this single pore point out into Lake Michigan. Um, so this is the Milwaukee River watershed to the north, the Menominee River watershed um, to the west, and then this little green one here is the Kinnikinnick River watershed uh, that's 93% urban, and that's where quite a few of the sites that I studied are gonna be. Uh, so if we look at them, as I mentioned, this is across a gradient in discharge. So again, we have two small headwater streams uh, that are flowing at about a half CFS. Then we have these two middle order streams. Um, uh, and I was talking to someone from Wauwatosa last night. So this one is Honey Creek in Wauwatosa. This is Wilson Park Creek, which flows out of General Mitchell International Airport. Um, and, uh, and those are more middle order streams. And then finally, we have these two rivers, both the main stem of the Kinnikinnick River, um, as well as Underwood Creek. Um, and these are approximately seven to nine CFS. So how do we assess ecological value? And um, I used to be one of those ecologists that cringed at words like ecological value, ecosystem health. Um, but I think it's a really valuable uh, way to phrase these things. And I'd happily continue the conversation uh, if any of you believe I shouldn't be using these words because uh, I think that's a great discussion to have. Um, but uh, I believe that um, it's a really tangible way to think about restorations, and especially when you're chatting with managers and the general public. Um, and so what I did is, I quantified different metrics of ecosystem structure and function in both these restorations, as you see here, as well as concrete channels immediately up or downstream of the restoration. And I did these measurements on the exact same day so we can do a comparison um, as to how much ecological value is gained by this restoration. And the way that I calculated that was using a log response ratio. Um, and so what you do is you take the mean of whatever you just measured in your treatment, or in this case, the restoration, and you divide by the same mean in your control reach, which in this case is the concrete channel. Um, and then because everything you measure has different units and different magnitudes, you take the log of it just to normalize everything, and then you get your L value. And so in brief, if L is a positive value, um, or above zero, sorry, that means that the restoration had a positive effect. 
If the L value is less than zero, the restoration had a negative effect. But important thing to note here, uh, of course, the words like positive and negative are all relative. Um, so sometimes you want a negative effect. You want something to decrease in the restoration. And so we always looked to literature values of uh, uh, less impacted streams in the Midwest to determine if uh, it was a gain in ecological value. So I wanted to just mention all the different measurements I took, and then I'll only go into a couple uh, given the time uh, constraint today. Um, so as I mentioned, I did different measures of ecosystem structure and function. And so the way that you can think of these two different uh, boxes is that ecosystem structural measurements, like on the left, taking a chlorophyll sample and working in urban areas, you have to be a little inventive about how you sample. Um, and so ecosystem structure is kind of like a snapshot. You can think of it as, as uh, any unit that's mass per volume or mass per area. So chlorophyll we measure as milligrams per meter squared. So that's a ecosystem structure, something that you take a snapshot of, and that's what's most commonly used in uh, assessment of restorations. You can go out and you can collect samples on one day, come back a week later and do it again. Um, but of course, uh, that great talk about nitrate concentrations is the reason why you need to take a lot of snapshots to really understand a system. Um, and so that's ecosystem structure. Here's a list of the metrics that I measured on these six different sites. Again, a, a restoration reach as well as a concrete channel. Um, and as you can see, they included different measures of physical metrics, biological, chemical, and then broader landscape metrics in the watershed. Um, what I also did, and this is where I think coming uh, at restorations from an ecological standpoint, um, is I measured different metrics of ecosystem function. And so rather than just mass per volume or mass per area, what this adds now is a time component. So it's mass per volume or area per time. So instead of a snapshot, this is more of a video. Um, and so you're, you're understanding how the system is working um, in real time at a specific moment in time. Um, and I think these metrics are really valuable um, for assessment and with the improvements in technology and such, um, kind of as Mark mentioned yesterday morning, uh, these metrics are becoming much more easy um, to do and easier to quantify. Um, and so the ones that I did here include some different metrics of transient storage on the physical side, whole stream metabolism on the biological side, and then some different nutrient uptake metrics and denitrification on the chemical side. So as I mentioned, given the time constraints, I'm only gonna be talking about a few of these and show you some results. Um, but again, I'm happy to chat more or share some more information later. Uh, so first, the main goal, tier one of these projects, were to alter the hydrology a little bit, make it more natural. So do these restorations alter hydrology? What I did is I did these continuous dye releases, um, so you can quantify transient storage metrics. Um, and what you do is you drip in a dye solution at a constant rate for about an hour, um, and you wait until the whole stream reach that you're uh, interested in is totally saturated in this dye, so it should all be this nice pink color. Um, and then you have a sensor downstream that's recording the dye concentration continuously. So if you were to have this hypothetical pipe that has no storage, it's just a, a pipe, um, you would be dripping the dye here and you'd have your sensor here. So as soon as you turn that uh, dye drip on, it takes a little bit of time. If we're looking at uh, time from release here and concentration of the dye on the y-axis, it takes a little bit of time before that dye labeled water gets to your sensor, right? Um, but then all of a sudden, because it's a pipe, uh, it just jumps right up to this new plateau, and then it's reading that plateau concentration for a while until you turn the drip off, and then it takes a little bit of time before that dye to flush out of the pipe, and then it drops right back down to your baseline. So that's what happens in a pipe. In a stream, though, you get this area of storage, and this area of storage can be backwaters, it can be the hyperios, which is uh, underneath the sediments, um, and it can, be, uh, it can slow the water down, and there's uh, a certain um, rate of exchange with this area of storage. And so when you do this dye release in a stream, um, you see a much different pattern. So it takes a little bit longer before that reaches plateau because this area of storage is filling up with dye. Likewise, when you turn that drip off, it takes quite a bit longer before all that dye flushes out of the system, again, because that dye is needing to flush out of this area of storage. And as I mentioned, these areas of storage can be backwater pools, um, as well as these hyperreic zones. Um, and these are not Milwaukee streams, these are the Southeast Alaska streams I worked in for my PhD. So um, a little bit different, but I think great examples of transient storage. So if we look at these urban streams, this is not a pipe. <laughs> 
even though it looks just like that pipe example I showed. This is our, uh, the concrete channel on that small stream, our smallest one, uh, about a half a CFS. Um, and you can see that it shoots up to a plateau pretty quick and then drops down pretty quick. But there is a little tail there. If we look at the restoration on that same channel, uh, we see the, the, the channel data are still there. They're just crammed over to the left now because the die went up and hit plateau so quick and came down. Um, and you can see that this restoration takes a lot longer before the die even shows up. And then it takes a while to reach the plateau, noisy plateau, and then there's pretty good tail going there. Um, so we see that the, the transient storage is definitely improved in the uh, restoration. And if we just look at something simple like travel time, in the concrete reach, the average travel time was three and a half minutes for an average molecule of dye, 56 minutes in the restoration, so a lot longer, over a full, full order of magnitude there. And then if we go to our other end member, our, our largest stream at about nine CFS, again, we see the, uh, sorry, the concrete channel looks kind of pipe-like, though now we're getting a bit more of a tail. Um, and when we look at the dye in the restoration, we see a much larger tail, and it takes a lot longer to get down to baseline. And here, travel time in the concrete reach was seven minutes, and in the restoration, 23. So if we put all the streams together, um, here we have streams along the x-axis going from the smallest to the largest. Um, at the top panel here, we have travel time. So the blue are the restoration uh, reaches. The gray are the concrete channels. And we can see that it's, uh, all the restorations have a longer travel time, which is good. You're improving the hydrology. When we look at the ratio of A sub S, so that storage area to the active channel area, A sub S over A, we see that in general, the yellow bars, the restorations are higher than the concrete channel. So you're also improving that ratio. You're making more storage area within the stream channel. So when we look at that log response ratio, again, to kind of normalize things, we see that travel time is all positive. Um, so it is uh, increasing travel time. Uh, but it seems like there's a relationship that it seems to drop as stream size increases. When we look at A sub S over A, we see that the pattern's a little more consistent across all six sites. It doesn't really uh, change by stream size. But then we have this little bit of an outlier where if you look uh, back here, WLP, this is the one that flows out of General Mitchell International, it actually had less uh, storage area in the restoration than the, uh, than the concrete channel. Um, and with any stream uh, work, you learn to replicate, but you learn even when you replicate, you still have outliers. And so this is a picture of that concrete channel, um, and you can just see the massive amounts of algae. So this right here is biotic storage going on. So the, bio the biology of the system is changing the hydrology substantially um, because these mats of algae are huge, and you can just imagine how much dye they would have hold held on to uh, during those dye releases. So going into the biology a little bit, um, what we did is we measured structural uh, metrics like chlorophyll A and then also whole stream metabolism. So I'm just gonna skip chlorophyll A and go right to the metabolism because I think that's a really great metric. Um, and what it is, is you monitor oxygen concentrations throughout 24 hour period, taking measurements every five to 10 minutes. Um, and what you can then estimate is the gross primary production, which is all the production from algae um, during the daytime. So you can see from about 7 a.m. here till, um, till about 2 or maybe solar noon even, uh, you're getting production of oxygen, increases in oxygen. Um, and then, of course, oxygen within a stream can be consumed by the heterotrophs. So this red splotch here represents bacteria, which is the main, uh, main heterotroph in streams that are consuming oxygen. But I always put a fish up there, too, because that's something that's a little more tangible to think about as a heterotroph. So we're getting respiration by everything that doesn't produce its own energy. And then the third uh, place that oxygen can go from a stream is, of course, the reoration. It can exchange with the atmosphere. Um, so you can throw oxygen data and temperature data into different models. Um, we used a Bayesian approach to be able to get some air on there. Um, and so if we start with our small stream here, uh, we have the concrete channel on the left, we have the restoration on the right. This is for a week in June, uh, I'm sorry, a week in July. We have primary production as positive numbers on the top because that represents the production of oxygen. And then we have respiration along the bottom as a consumption of oxygen. So if we look at that, what jumps out right away um, is that there's much higher primary production and restoration, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, pr production and respiration in the restoration. Uh, a lot of tongue twisting here. 
Um, and so uh, it appears that the restoration uh, increases whole stream metabolism. Um, and it's a bit more nuanced, um, but in this case, the black bars are all bigger than the green bars. Um, and when you do a ratio of uh, P to R, production to respiration, um, you can determine if your stream is heterotrophic, which means it actually consumes more oxygen than it produces, or if it's autotrophic. So in the case of this little headwater, it was heterotrophic. So the black bars are slightly bigger than the green bars here. Um, and then when we look at our big stream, what we had was we were able to deploy oxygen sensors here for a full three months. And this is where I really think that um, whole stream metabolism can be a great metric for restorations and, um, and assessing them. So what you can see is we have a full three months of data here in the concrete channel and the restoration. And you get at that really fine variation in day-to-day -day, um, production and respiration. Um, and what I like to call this is sort of the heart rate of the stream. Um, so if any of you are uh, uh, health fanatics, you might take your heart rate every morning uh, or once a week, and then you can tell if your heart rate's high, maybe you're stressed out. Um, if your heart rate's low, maybe uh, you're coming off of Thanksgiving holiday or something. Um, but uh, if you measure your heart rate often enough, you kind of know when you're stressed out and when you're not. I think you can do the same thing with whole stream metabolism. If you're measuring it often enough, um, and even season to season, year to year, you can see if the stream is stressed out or not. Um, and what we have here, first of all, is that if you look, for instance, in the restoration in, in July, we see a lot more production than respiration. So this is highly autotrophic, which is not normal for a stream ecosystem. Uh, when we put in the small stream, the average of the small stream, we see that the large river uh, had much more production and respiration. Um, and we can see high, high daily variation. If you focus just on this one week in September, we see that there was a crash in production and then this stepwise increase afterwards. So if you're interested in what happened, you could look back at the hydrograph. This was surely a storm. Um, and then you get this recovery of algae and the recovery of production afterwards. Um, and so in this way, uh, whole stream metabolism can be used as a great tool um, for monitoring, monitoring uh, restorations, as I said. So if we just put these back to back, just the restorations, we see that the P to R ratio, so if you just divide these numbers by each other, 15 over 11 gives you a P to R ratio of 1.4. Um, so that's autotrophic, more production than respiration. And then here in the small stream, we see that it's heterotrophic. Um, and then again, further extending this analogy of stream health, uh, Roger Young, who's a New Zealand uh, stream ecologist, he wanted to put this in the context of uh, healthy, satisfactory, or poor stream quality. Um, and when we throw on blue dots for the large river, red dots for the small stream, we see that we're really pushing uh, satisfactory or poor on all of these metrics. Um, and so these urban streams, though hydrolog hydrologically speaking, are restored, biologically they're still not. So the tier two or three, we're still working on. Um, and we can see that there's positive L values, but in this case, positive numbers bad. Production this high is not natural. <laughs> uh, so then the last slide um, is that we also measured denitrification. And denitri denitrification is important because it permanently removes nitrogen from the system. And this is something I'm really interested in, especially getting going uh, once I moved down to Des Moines. Um, I was only able to measure this in one stream because only one concrete channel had slow enough uh, velocity and a low enough gradient to actually cause sediment accumulation, um, and that was this stream here. But we saw some really awesome results. We saw that in the restoration, denitrification was almost twice as high as the concrete channel. Uh, the method we used was the new MIMS method, uh, so it's a little different than what you heard yesterday about the acetylene block. This is actually real-time in situ measurement of denitrification. We didn't change the habitat at all or make that an, an, um, an anoxic environment, so this is real uh, res uh, denitrification rates going on. So to conclude, uh, do restorations uh, improve urban stream ecosystems? Uh, if any of you were around in the 90s and you remember the band Oasis, uh, they had this album called Definitely Maybe, um, and I think that that really summarizes this well. So if you're looking at the main goal of MMSD, does it uh, improve hydrologically? Yes, it does. These restored reaches are much more natural, which any of you in this room would have guessed going from concrete to a restoration. Biologically, though, these are still pretty impaired, 
ecosystems. And I think that we're going to have to address broader watershed scale issues like water quality, impervious surface, et cetera, et cetera, before the biology responds. But of course, we do have in this picture here, you do see that the habitat is there. We just need to do some other uh, projects now at a broader watershed scale. And then finally, chemically, I put a little maybe mark there um, because denitrification did increase in a restored reach. Of course, we have an N of one. I also have a ton of uptake metrics for nitrogen, uh, ammonium and nitrate, as well as phosphorus that I didn't share today, but I'd be happy to talk about it at lunch. Um, but it would still be a squiggly mark. It's still kind of maybe. <laughs> um, so with that, I'd happily take any questions, comments, or hear suggestions from non-ecologists, even though I have very little time. Thank you. I'm actually going to ask you to save your questions for Peter for lunch. <laughs>